Hey folks, Dennis Foster here, Focus Outdoors TV. We're in eastern South Dakota today and we're going to be talking pheasants. And we're not talking hunting pheasants right now, we're talking conservation so we do have something to hunt. We're on one of the properties that I lease as part of my pheasant hunting operation here in the state and this is a heck of a property. The landowner's done a great job, but we want to tweak it, make it perfect. With that, we're eliciting a little bit of help here. We've got farm bill biologist Sam Wyman, Sam, excuse me, Sam Freiman <laughs> out of Redfield, South Dakota, uh, my county seat. And he's going to help us give us a little rundown of uh, what Pheasants Forever is all about, what they do, and how they can help with projects like this. Yeah, well, Pheasants Forever is a nonprofit organization. We, in my job, I basically get to work with landowners every single day on habitat projects. We get some shelter belts out here, we got some grass, and I get to come out and walk around with people and basically do exactly what we're talking about doing today. Exactly. So. You know, and there's been a lot of really good common sense measures made out here, and, and you'll see that as, as we survey the property. You know, one of the things that interests me is the pollinator plots. You know, yeah. you're hearing a lot more about that, and, and common sense dictates to me that that should be a part of it because we're not seeing you know the wildflowers and the stuff that we used to do with modern eggs. Right, exactly, yeah. There's a, a lot of these little odd areas. They're great places if you've got some weird angles and fields or anything like that. It's a great place to do something like that. Exactly, you know, and we had a conversation on the way down about an hour ride on the way down here about how the farmers can still farm, make a living, use modern practices, but leave little spots like this. Exactly. You know, it, it's just perfect for birds, it, it's perfect for the area, it just rounds out, you know, the whole ecosystem. And, right. You know, with that, let's take a look at this ground, get some of your recommendations, and we'll see what we can do. All right, sounds good. Perfect. We're out here uh, surveying various aspects of this property and the piece we're on looks really good to me just from a good old boy standpoint growing up in Spink County where the pheasant thing started. I'm going to lean on Sam here to tell us exactly technically why is this good? What do you like about this? Well alfalfa is a pretty commonly used habitat for pheasants to nest in and one of the biggest problems you have with that though is that when guys come in to cut their alfalfa, they end up chopping up a lot right, of ants sitting right, on their nest. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually a really good situation here because we're in the end of June and this is still cut. So these, the nests that have been out here in this field, they should be hatched by now. The birds are going to be fine when he comes out here to cut this for his alfalfa. As long as he's not running across this field really fast, he's, the chicks are going to be old enough and big enough, they're going to be able to get out of the way and be just fine. Exactly. And we've got some shelter belts and stuff around here too that have some grass in them. They provide some nesting benefit too. There's a little wetland down right over the hill here that's got some grass in it too that's going to be good, good nesting cover too. And the alfalfa also acts as an important root area because it attracts the seeds. That's what the chicks need to eat their first few weeks of life is they eat almost solely insects. So. You bet. The moral of the story to me here is the farmer doing a good job just holding off just a little bit and letting things take place, letting nature take care of itself. 
and with just a little bit of cooperation, it's huge. Because like you said, if they go out here and hay this early, they're going to do some damage. Yeah, no doubt about it. Absolutely. Perfect, perfect. We'll uh, continue on and showcase more of the property. You know, before we leave this piece of alfalfa, uh, uh, Sam and I were just having a discussion on what does make it good, and he brought up some very valid points I'd, I'd like you to share with the folks okay. here. So one of the things that makes alfalfa so good for rear-grade cover is the fact that it, it provides a good, dense overhead canopy, but it's really thin underneath, and it allows the chicks to move around really easily under the alfalfa, so they get plenty of room to forage. So if you're standing here and you look straight down on top of the alfalfa, it's got good overhead cover. You really can't see the dirt at all. But when you go down here and you go like this, there's plenty of open space down there and plenty of open areas for the birds to be able to get down and move around. And that's really important. You know, when you're a baby chick, baby pheasant chick, you're probably the size of your thumb. And that's something that just, they can't move around in thick, heavy cover that easily. So these thin, Thin stands of cover are what those baby chicks need in their first few weeks of life. And the alfalfa also attracts a lot of insects, and that's 90% of a chick's diet for the first eight weeks of its life is insects. I would also assume being the cover, once they're down there and they can move around, it probably makes the hunting for the insects a little bit easier for them. Yeah. I absolutely. would assume because the insects can't move away quite as quick. Right, yeah. The, in, the, in the insects stuff. are kind of trapped from above. Right. And they're all, a lot of the a lot of the insects that they're eating early on that are actually ants. And so they're down there crawling around on the ground anyway, so they just run okay. around underneath the south alpha. Midwest Gun Dog Kennels is your full-time gun dog training facility. For over 30 years, we've customized our training to fit each individual gun dog. We know it takes a well-trained gun dog to handle wild birds to make every hunting trip a dream trip. Let Midwest Gun Dog Kennels put excitement back into your hunt of a lifetime. Midwest Gun Dog Kennels, where experience equals excellence. No matter the size, age, or activity level of your best friend, you want a dog food that's natural, feeds great, and is full of all the goodness you demand. That's what we pack into every bag of Country Vet Naturals. Country Vet Naturals are just what the name says, natural goodness in every bag. We also make grain-free cat and dog food and treats. Learn more and find a dealer at CountryVetNaturals.com. Country Vet Naturals, loved by pets, trusted by owners. Cool. As you might be able to tell, I spent a lot of time behind a shotgun. Whether it's at the clay target fields, sporting clays fields, doing exhibitions, or bird hunting, I always trust my shooting skills to the Rio Elite. Not only for the lighter recoil, but as you can tell, the harder hitting, consistent patterns. These clay targets don't stand a chance when you shoot Rio Elite. Make your next day on the water even better with Airwave Pedestal, the only air suspension system that can be custom adjusted to the weight of the rider. No unreliable springs, no oil-filled shocks to leak. Our patented design utilizes a two-stage suspension system to smooth out the roughest ride, a limiting travel to an industry-leading two inches. This boating season, enjoy your time on the water to the fullest. Find out how at airwavepedestal.com. All right, we're uh, about halfway through this particular property, and we're looking around, and it'll show we did some drone footage here. It's got excellent tree claims. It's got an excellent draw coming through here. It's spring-fed. There's water sources, so forth. And it, to me, it looks like good nesting cover. There's a ton of grass here, but it isn't exactly perfect. And explain why. Right. So most of this grass out here is actually smooth brome. It's... It's an introduced grass, it's not native to right. the Great Plains, and it just, birds will nest in it, but it's not the, not the best thing that you can have. Ideally for nesting cover, you're gonna want what we call dense nesting cover. 
and it typically ends up being waist high or so you'll have a lot of you'll have a lot of leftover residual cover from last year and then you'll have some flush new green growth down at the bottom it kind of helps thermoregulate where the birds are actually going to be nesting at so it maintains a constant temperature down there at okay. the bottom, which so, is really important if, so if we had you know spring of the year we got some cooler temps i imagine that plays a role right. in that yep. then Yep, it helps hold some heat. It also helps keep things cool if you get a really hot day. Okay. So it's really important. Uh, like I said, the brome's not the greatest thing in the world. They will use it and they will nest in it. But, I mean, you can see this is some of the taller stuff we've got out here. It's about knee high with the seed heads coming up to your waist. And ideally, you want a thick, full stand up to about waist high. Okay. You know, and then, uh, then what's a guy do to correct this? I mean versus, you know, oh God, you know, just kill it all off and start over. Are there other kind of intermediate measures to improve it to there's, begin with? Yeah, there's a few different things you could try to do. You could do some interseeding, which you could try interseeding some other grasses. It's honestly not that successful. It's kind of hard to do and can be time consuming and kind of expensive. Uh, another thing that's actually kind of a popular option, people will use, actually use cattle. If you can come in early in the spring and use livestock and just graze it down to basically the end of June to where you have just a short little field left. If you have any residual warm season grasses or any natives, they'll actually take advantage of that okay, grazing that'll event. Allow them to come it'll up allow, then. Allow, it'll come, allow them to come on up. The other thing you can do is prescribed fire. And so here we would have, if you wanted to do a prescribed fire here, you could go down through, you could put fire breaks around every single side of it, and then you just have to wait for the ideal conditions in the spring and come in here and have a good controlled burn. Right. Um, is there chemical, on, on the idea of fire and burn, is there chemical burn down options where a guy could say, you know, patchwork this in, burn down some spots, plant, you know, some, some better grasses, alfalfas, you know, the clover. What do you think of clover? Right. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, sweet clover, any any of the clovers actually provide some pretty good pretty good cover. They do a lot for attracting insects. They'll, right. help, they'll help with the brood rearing. Uh, as far as your cover, doing some kind of a chemical burn down, you can do that. I've, I've worked with a couple people that have tried doing stuff like that. And it's, it's kind of the same as just doing straight interseeding. It kind of has mixed results. Okay, okay. So I guess moral of the story is is just get out, try a few different things on your own piece of property, and yeah. you know, see what may work for you. Something I want to allude to too, and this piece isn't just for property property owners or folks like me that lease property. It's for everybody. You know, this is an educational process, but the way everybody can help is joining organizations like Pheasants Forever, your local conservation clubs, whatever you can do. Call in senators, congressmen, get after them on this CRP, become proactive, because this stuff just isn't going to magically appear just for you to hunt. We've got a responsibility to put in some effort ourselves, and not just for selfish reasons, meaning ourselves, but our generations to come. Set the groundwork for this type of thing. We'll set precedent. People will see the value in it. We'll attract more people, and the thing just grows. And and just that leads into pheasants forever. Look how it's grown exponentially. Absolutely. Over the years, quite frankly, when it first came out, I thought, well, what's that goofy Minnesota operation? We don't need them guys. Great. You know, by God, we do. Things have changed, and it's important to become part of it. Yep. Sam and I are just having a conversation here, and we're going to walk up to the camera and kind of continue it. Uh, we've got brome grass uh, throughout this valley. It's not native to the Dakotas. And we're just bringing up about the original grasses and the forbs and so forth, how we reestablish some of that, what some of the options are, and just kind of share what, what you told me. It enlightened okay. me a little bit here. Okay. So, yeah, what we were talking about was how prescribed fire can be used as a tool for you to maintain your grasslands because fire was actually the the main source of keeping the prairies prairies back pre-settlement and the natural cycle of how the prairies were kept under control is the prairie was fire right. and it wasn't because trees wouldn't grow here because we plant trees all the time they obviously grow here it's because prairie fire came across the prairie fairly routinely anywhere from three to thirty year cycles is pretty much what they've found out and when those fires came across the prairie they killed off the trees and kept the grass and native prairie intact. Sure and then uh, before the settlers got here too with obviously thousands and thousands 
thousand square miles of it. I'm sure once lightning struck and a fire hit and we get our South Dakota winds, yep. it, it just clean the slate off, so to speak, and let everything start over again. Yep. And it would, you would have those things run until they hit, ran into a lake or a river or some some kind of natural feature that they couldn't cross is how far those fires would run. Right, right. So, you know, we're just looking at trying to improve things here. You know, as we mentioned before, on the surface, this is, boy, there's grass out here. This is all wonderful. It's perfect. Not quite. There's some things that we can do. And uh, that's why we're out here eliciting your help and your advice to uh, put some of these things into practice. We are going to make this a long-term project. This is short-term right now to get the uh, uh, ball rolling here. It's going to be a several-year project. We're going to document all of it. Uh, probably the takeaway I'd like you folks to have out of this, it's never too late to start. You know, we didn't get a start early this spring. We're at the end of, end of June here going into July. But by God, we're going to get things started, have a firm... Uh, basis laid groundwork, literally groundwork, for the following years here. Midwest Gun Dog Kennels is your full-time gun dog training facility. For over 30 years, we've customized our training to fit each individual gun dog. We know it takes a well-trained gun dog to handle wild birds to make every hunting trip a dream trip. Let Midwest Gun Dog Kennels put excitement back into your hunt of a lifetime. Midwest Gun Dog Kennels, where experience equals excellence. Dakota Pheasant Guide offers the best wild pheasant hunts from the Glacial Lakes area of South Dakota west to the Missouri River. Packages available include everything from self-guided to fully guided hunts. Book your bird hunting adventure now. Fisherman, iTime Promotions is your ticket to an enjoyable and successful day on the water. Call Dennis Foster for your outdoor adventure of a lifetime. Dennis Foster here. I'd like to introduce you to the Drado Catch and Release Boat Latch System. It's back the trailer into the water, pop the cord, and away we go. Once our day in the water is done, we simply roll the boat up onto the bunks until it achieves contact with the bow eye. It clicks securely into place, away we go. We are exclusive partners with B2Outdoors.com. That's where you're going to want to go and order your very own system. You can enter the promo code ITIME PROMOTIONS and receive free shipping on your items. When it comes to dog food and treats, you want something natural. A dog food or special reward that feeds great, is made in the USA, and helps your best friend live a long and healthy life. That's what you get with Country Vet Naturals, natural goodness in every bag. And for those of you who want grain-free, we've got that too. Find a dealer and learn more about Country Vet Naturals dog food, cat food, and treats at CountryVetNaturals.com. Country Vet Naturals, loved by pets, trusted by owners. examine the grasslands in this uh, draw in a little finer detail. It's kind of interesting because we've got Sam here that knows all the different plant types and specifically the native plant types. If you just kind of want to point out what some of these are and then give us a rundown, how do we get this stuff back? Okay. Well, we talked a little bit ago just about doing prescribed fire and the fact that these things are here still in the stand of brown grass would lead me to believe that there probably is still a seed bank down here that would probably come back across here. So what we've got here is actually common milkweed. This is a very important native pollinator. It's it's a keystone species actually for the monarch butterfly. Right. So odds are you've heard a lot in the news about monarchs and how they might be listed in the native species, that kind of everything like that. And the loss of milkweed is the primary reason why, you know, why they that gets back to the to the balance. I mean, exactly. just getting things in balance, it benefits everything. What are these pretty guys? Those are purple cone flowers. They are, there's some prairie cone flower up the hill just a little ways that we stopped and saw. They are 
pretty close to this. They're actually very close relatives of one another. This is uh, purple, the prairie coneflower is a yellow flower. Pretty common. People see them all the time probably and just don't know that's what they are. Exactly. Me included, without a doubt. Exactly. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the fire can, in effect, revive this. Right. As it had in the past, these seeds lay dormant for decades. Yep. And, and are still viable once we remove all that, that, that top cover. There. Yep. Yeah, and primarily what you're trying to do with that top cover is if you get down in here, you've got years and years and years of this dead grass and thatch down there that are basically just laying down there keeping all those seeds suppressed. Mm -hmm. So if you run a fire across here at the right time of year, you'll burn all of this stuff off and you'll open up that seed bank. And if that seed bank is present in the soil, it'll end up coming up. Okay, that so that, that would be much preferred than if we were to come out here and say, you know, disc it half a dozen times just trying to get rid of that garbage. Right, yep, that would, yeah, running something like that, the least, the less disturbance you can do on something like this, the better off you're going to be. Imagine the seeds more, are closer to the surface, yep, more likely to germinate, yep, that type of thing. Your seeds are going to be close to the surface, and if you run through and disc something, you're probably going to end up having more problems with Bringing not weeds. just weeds than yep. you will your actual natives okay. that you're trying to bring back. Very, very good information, very enlightening. Uh, and simple. I mean, as modern as we get and all the technology we get, it comes right back to what nature has done for us for years. Exactly. And our controlling nature sometimes kind of kicks us in the butt. Yep. You know, we can certainly right the ship here. All right, we're continuing our tour of this property, heading up to another piece to show Sam, and just come across this stuff here, which I found interesting. And what this is, this area was a food plot, meaning you know, corn or sorghum was planted here in the past. And what they've done is taken and planted this to, and you can tell me, some sort of a wheatgrass here. Yeah, it's one of the wheatgrasses. Okay. And in part of taking care of things here, we've got Canadian thistle that they have sprayed. So they're doing a good job getting that burned down and letting this come up. Yep. And a uh, question I pose to you too, in effect what we've got is a perennial food plot with this, don't we? Because they're going to utilize these seeds, I would imagine? Yeah, the birds will, will eventually eat those seeds and come this fall when they mature and fall. They will utilize, they will utilize grass seeds as a food source. And the other thing too, we'll end up, this will actually end up being some pretty good nesting habitat because the, one of the good things about these nice young grass stands is they do stay kind of thin like we talked about earlier and it does provide really good nesting habitat for birds. So okay. when okay. you're working with programs such as CRP where you're doing some kind of a grass planting, the most productive time of those seedings for wildlife are usually about the first five years and then things kind of slowly start to go downhill. Okay. And that's why... <laughs> Well, yeah, right on cue, we got a rooster cackling in the background here, uh, proof positive for us here. Um, it looks to me, too, like you mentioned the overhead cover type of stuff. It looks like it does a little better job of providing that than the brome grass that we've been previously discussing. Right. This is probably, I'm going to guess just from looking at this, this was probably seeded as a dormant seeding this last year, maybe even early this spring. So... You can kind of see, you can kind of pick out the rows a little bit. You can yep. see where the, you can see where the rows of the plant are going down through there. Yeah. So next, next spring, this stuff will end up being your good residual cover that's this tall. And odds are, this is all probably just one plant. It's more of a bunch grass more than what the smooth brome is. Right, right. And it's obviously holding really good insects here. So there's another, another benefit to it there and you're spot on on that two falls ago this was corn because we walked okay. it and, and shot several birds out of it and I, I like what they've done here you know it, it's more of a, a natural type setting and from a purist hunting standpoint it's a lot more fun to watch your dogs run around and stuff right perfect okay we're stopping uh, and I stopped the, the ATV here looking at some of these different flowers which are pretty but they also serve a purpose and quite frankly I don't know what they are. We got a guy here that does, so we're going to find out what they are. What are we looking at? This one right here is actually purple prairie clover. It's not starting to flower out yet. It's getting really close, but it's just got this little cone, this cone head on it, and there'll be a bunch of little purple flowers come off of this. There's actually one flowering right over there now that I look. And then this one right here, this is actually a native wood, woody shrub. This is called lead plant. 
I didn't get to put much of these little purple flowers on it too. And this, when this actually gets to where there's flowers covering this entire thing, it's actually a really cool looking plant. Okay. I would assume that's an insect magnet as well. Absolutely. Any any of these native native pollinators are they don't even. Okay, any of these native pollinators that have have these flowers on them are going to attract a lot of insects. Okay. Is it something that we'd find in the mixes that you guys produce? So yeah, we yeah, this is a seed source that's actually commercially available. We can put together a seed mix that does have okay. plant in it. Okay. The thing I like is we're getting the prairie back to the prairie versus just some dirt that's a commodity. Right. You know, it, it, it's got other values, and especially if you're an outdoors. All right, we're going to wrap up our initial segment of our evaluation of a couple different properties here with our uh, pheasant biologist from Pheasants Forever. We're going to do this rather quickly. We've got a storm rolling in, which is good. Moisture is always good. Uh, conservation does begin with a conversation. Who do the folks need to talk to to do something like this on their own, no matter where they're at? And what else are you guys involved in? It isn't just pheasants. Right. Uh, Really just depends on where you're at. We can do, Pheasants Forever has people all across the country. We have mule deer biologists in Idaho. We have people in Pennsylvania working with warblers. And then we've got biologists all across the, the Great Plains working with pheasants. And then we've got people working with quail in, in the southern part of the country too. So if you want to talk with somebody from Pheasants Forever, just go to pheasantsforever.org and go to the find a biologist page, type in your zip code and it'll get you in touch with a representative from that area. Uh, as far as South Dakota goes, we've got private lands biologists with state game fish and parks here. We've got Pheasants Forever and then we've got U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also and you can get a hold of any of those people through habitat.sd.gov. That's the South Dakota Habitat Days website. Yeah, that would be a great first place to start. If, you, if you're having trouble finding people in any of those places, just go to your local county NRCS office, and they have NRCS offices in every county all across the country. Okay, and, and what that spells out is this is truly a partnership amongst people, organizations, landowners, outfitters. We all have an interest in this. And by God, if you're looking for an organization to join, Pheasants Forever would be a good one. Uh, even if you're a member of other outfits, D or whatever it is, they're a good operation to get involved. We thank you for your help, and uh, yeah. we're going to keep track of this. We will be documenting it for the next couple of years, so stay tuned, and uh, we're going to show you some good results here. Thanks. Diesel train rolls down the line As I'm headed for the land of corn and rye There is a place I'm always satisfied Full of remedies to ease my worried mind Like pulling catfish on the banks of Cherry Cove Watching wood ducks glide like angels to the shore I'm gonna find me a dirt road Get right.